Great. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm Jeroen Willemsen. You'll hear me for 45 minutes talking. So I just want to know a little bit about you guys. Who of you here is a developer? Quite some. Who of you is here a pen tester? Awesome. Who of you here is a manager? CISOs? All right. We got a lot of different people. I hope I'll bring something for each and all of you. Um, so my name is Jeroen Willemsen. Um, this is me. Um, here's Twitter account if you want to follow stuff about a mobile security testing guide. I think that's most important. Let's get started. So today I want to talk about the mobile application security verification standard. Let's call it MASVS for now. Um, the mobile security testing guide. I want to do some examples. But before we continue, I want to have a toast with you guys because we recently got flagship status. So. <laughs> I just want to toast to all the volunteers that helped us, especially people like Harold Blankenship uh, at the board level, but also the leaders that have done all this stuff, everybody who filed issues, pull requests, or, or they were contributing in any other way. Because um, this project is not just me, this project is a bunch of people. And that will be repeated throughout the talk because frantically I'm just happy that I can hear, share all this stuff with you guys um, because of the force of OWASP, basically. And I think that's brilliant. So let's get started. Um, sorry? <laughs> sorry, yeah. Cheers, guys, sorry. So um, in order to keep it a little bit interactive, I have a bunch of questions. So um, who of you knows a little bit about mobile security? All right. So many of you should be able to answer these questions. Let's start with the first one, shall we? So can you do a cross-site scripting attack on a native mobile application? Sorry? It's a unlikely, yeah. Does anybody think anything else? Do you think this is easy to do or possible? And how would it be possible if it would be possible? So everybody thinks it's impossible. Sorry, just rephrase. Okay, so who thinks it's possible? Raise hands. Who, f who could think of a method to do this? It's getting tougher, isn't it? Shall we try another one? Just food for thought, because we'll get to them later. Cross site request forgery. Would this be possible on a native app? Who thinks it's possible? All right. Who could think of a method to do so? Well, it could be a version of it, of course, because you're talking intents, I suppose. Yeah, so there's also URL schemes. So yeah, there's possibilities in there. Yeah, if, if that will be loaded, definitely, definitely. But as you can see, you have to think a little harder about this one. If I would present something about JavaScript, it would be fairly easy, wouldn't it? But now all of a sudden, ooh, we got, we got turned on, didn't we? At least our hats, that is. So, um, mobile security is a little bit different. Um, in the sense that stuff is different. CSRF is different. Cross-site scripting is different. But post traversal is just ordinary easy and often forgotten like they forgot with the uh, uh, office application. So you could just go through all directories within the, the sandbox, including the documents that should have been there privately. But what about other stuff? Let's talk about data leaking. So through logging, so your logcat or your logging output from, uh, from your iOS application, your insecure storage, because you thought using the SD card was a good idea. Or what about IPC? So app extensions, sharing data in the wrong way, intents, packing a lot of extra stuff that shouldn't be there. And we can continue on and on and on about this. Um, and what about weak authentication mechanisms? Um, I think there has been a long period where you could actually just get a ticket for AppSec as a speaker by just breaking something open and show how broken it was in terms of a mobile app because people forgot about it or well, maybe just didn't know. Um, and what about reverse engineering? Because all of a sudden all that logic is on the client side. So we start promising stuff about how you could make it hard for an attacker to get through. Um, yeah, so it's different. So we tried to come up with a solution a few years ago already and that's this. So we got a bunch of things basically going on. First of all, there's the 
um, mobile application security verification standard, which basically sets up a bunch of requirements on what you should do in order to have security hygiene. Um, for those, by the way, making pictures and stuff, um, slides will be online, YouTube's recorded. If you have questions, I'd rather have you raise your hand so we can talk about it and make it a little bit interactive. Because hearing my voice for 45 minutes might not be the best idea. Okay, good. Um, other than that is the MSTG basically, which basically explains how you implement those requirements. And we'll see how that works a little bit later. Next to that, especially for the CISOs that have a little bit of a classical environment, we got compliancy checklists. And that might sound odd, but it actually works very well, even for non-CISO environments. If you offer basically a list of these are the requirements you should abide by, and they are combining with the links towards the right chapters in the MSTG to implement them, stuff becomes very easy because now there's no more excuse for stack overflow you can just direct them to the parts you have to be um, so obviously this is something pre-skf and we're talking to the tenkater brothers or talking with the tenkater brothers to actually implement that um, to have masvs and mcg also in skf but for now this can do at least some basic job in helping people out and if you want to play around we got a bunch of mobile apps so we got crack me to do reverse engineering Find the passcode, find the password, do funny stuff. And we got a bunch of hacking apps in various languages where you can just try to uh, break SSL pinning, where you can try to uh, download the storage, to get all the information, confidential data and stuff. And alongside that track, there's a lot more because our focus is actually native apps, but we got an increasing demand for, hey, but how do I do this in Xamarin? Or how do I do this in something else? So we got a side project set up to basically cover the similar requirements for React Native, Xamarin, and Flutter, and which means going into Dart, uh, the latter one. But for all cases, we still need volunteers. So we've set up these uh, checklists online, check them out through the MCG. And if you are very um, well equipped uh, in the hybrid space, please come and help us to fix that for the people that have asked about it. Um, we also are setting up an, or fostering a daughter project, uh, the mobile threat model project, because it's nice to have controls and direct somebody directly to just implement this. Come on, just do it. That's easier. But the modern developers in many societies don't work that way. They often start asking why. So we have the why in our heads when we created this and in the issues you can see why the requirement is relevant. Uh, but that's not an easy way to work. So right now we're setting up a mobile threat model around it to make it easier to let them understand what to do. In the end, if you just want to put requirements down somebody's face, let's go. Other than that, we try to um, unify all those mobile projects because there's been a lot of dying stuff out there. So we try to combine that. And together with that, um, we try to motivate people to open source the stuff they wrote based on the MSTG so that we can promote the ecosystem. And we really mean we as a team behind the MSCG project. So we try to really make a change, not just some mobile part, but go beyond that. If we're successful, I don't know. I'll leave that up to you guys to judge. So these are the people that did a lot of the hard work, uh, both during Open Security Summits. That's where the larger beef happens. But enough about the background. Let's go into the details of the stuff that's happening. So the MASVS basically is a set of, in master right now, 81 requirements. The last stable version, 114, has 64, I believe. And it's divided over certain areas where you can have the requirements. So architecture and design, all the other jazz, which you just can read. And what we're trying to do is trying to guide people on what you should implement and when. So for your basic marketing app, you should at least have some standard security. Let's call it hygiene, you know, making sure you got a proper base. Stuff we ask there is not hard. It's something you can do by default, even sometimes by stack overflow programming. That's still possible, not a problem. Um, the L2 defense adapt are a bit harder. Those are for apps that actually have risk um, when it will be broken. So think about banking apps. Think about your commercial app that actually has paid contact that people have paid for and those kind of things. And on top of that, if you want to do some IP protection, we got reverse engineering category. So as you can see, it makes sense to start doing this. And then depending on what you think is worth it, start sele at selecting the right requirements from the other ones. And lately we've seen that some of the uh, companies that have embraced this also started to handpick this in terms of prioritization and then make sure you at least have some basic hygiene and walk on. But as long as you have some leveling, it's easier to prioritize. 
So let's have a look at those requirements, shall we? So um, um, these are, for instance, requirements regarding uh, um, uh, storage and privacy. And let's highlight one of them because these uh, requirements are also, um, well, of, first of all, they will be opinionated because we thought of them basically, and we've thought of them together with many other people. Um, and the requirements will change over time because the world around us changes over time. So let's have an example about that one. Um, the clipboard is deactivated on text fields that may contain sensitive data. Because, you know, if you would copy paste that, so why would we do this? Why would you think it's important to disable the clipboard? Exactly, because it's shared. So what if we would disable that in the password field? What would happen with modern password managers? They'll broke. Yeah, they'll be broken. So we're back. So that didn't work. So we evicted it again. So as you can see, even though we tried to be stable, we just tag a version with a stable set of requirements, which you then try to let live at least for half a year and never abandon in that sense. So people can select the requirements they believe in. Uh, and in the meantime, we go on, but we do try to keep it as stable as possible because, um, well, you'll hear later on, you'll, you'll be able to figure out why in a moment. So the current status, version 114, we added some MSDG IDs, which are basically IDs that correlate to IDs in the chapter heads, which you'll see in the next slide. Uh, we got a bunch of translations. Some of them are really beautiful. Just staring at them makes me, you know, very impressed because I don't read traditional Chinese, but it looks really beautiful. Um, it is vetted, the, the translations. So basically we have a group of translators and a group of verifiers. So you know that the moment something is translated, that different people have checked it out. Uh, and therefore you can rely on that because we think it's important to have something only when we can really ensure that it will have value. Otherwise you end up, you know, uh, hoping something is okay. And I don't think that's a good solid basis. Uh, we have a growing adoption, so we're, we're the way to do it according to NIST. Um, there's a bunch of governments that uh, are enabling this in, in their um, uh, governmental programs. Um, for even on the EU level, it's right now being promoted within the mobile payments uh, area. So that's pretty cool. We got a lot of companies embracing it. And if your company is embracing it and you want to show that, let us know. So we'll add you to the users.md file so they know that if you're a pen tester, you know how to work with this. Or if you're just a developer working with this, then other people might know, okay, so it actually makes sense to move on with this. Um, right now, we're basically uh, creating new and updated requirements to align with the other projects that were either dying or very active, so that it won't be uh, that we are missing certain requirements at the other end. It won't be that we're trying to conflict with them. Sometimes it also means working together with the guys from the ASVS to make sure you also have uh, alignment with them, because we started off aligned in version 0.1, and then everybody diverted. So now we're trying to make sure that what we say makes sense to in what you read over there and vice versa, so that we as OWASPs have a single voice in that sense. Um, we hope to make this all released at December because we still have to go through the translation process, yada, yada, et cetera. Um, about those MSCG IDs, here's an example. So this is basically a modern layout of the network uh, requirements. Not all of them, just a few. As you can see, that ID correlates with over there, so you can just grab within the MCG or just search on GitHub, and it will be fairly easy to see how we want to explain that requirement to you. More importantly, how you can contribute. So we got contributor guidance over there. Just check it out. It's fairly easy. Um, if you look at contributing.md at the uh, uh, MSTG uh, uh, repo, it's also fine. Or just Slack us through OWASP Slack and we'll be okay. I would say take it, read it, use it, tweet about it, contribute, or just give feedback in person. If there's something you think is really wrong, we would love to learn from you. Because no matter what the masses say by adopting it just and moving forward, it might still be that we're doing something awfully wrong and we just blind by the fact that we're doing it that way for a few years. So if you see something that could be improved, let us know, file an issue, uh, create a pull request, and let's go together. All right. Mobile security testing guide. So the testing guide is divided in three parts. We got the general testing guide because lots of the stuff is the same. In the end, if you do some authorization stuff in iOS, I hope you do the same in Android. Otherwise, you're in a fun place to be. Um, and then we get specifics for the platforms. Next to that is a bunch of crack meets, which were created by one of the first leaders, Bernard Mueller. 
I would say try them out. Show me your reverse engineering skills. Come with new write-ups and show how cool you are by breaking it. Um, it's a nice challenge. Um, by the way, we already have a lot of write-ups, so if you're completely stuck, you can peek and spoil your own fun a little bit and at least get through them. Next is the MSCG Playground, so we have a bunch of different apps, a Kotlin app, a Java app for Android, and um, an Objective-C app for uh, iOS, so it's easier to swizzle. And I believe we're also doing some stuff in, uh, in Swift. But really, this whole project um, has a lot of contributors. It's really about standing on the shoulders of giants. Because before we did the stuff in GitHub, there have been two initiatives with just Google Docs. Uh, people like Milan Singh Takur um, added, started doing stuff over there. And we just revived the project on GitHub and tried to grow it and foster it. So in that sense, this has been one of the most, I think it was one of the coolest projects I've ever um, got sucked into. And I never wanted to, to get out anymore. So if you want to have a similar friendly experience in a very cool, um, well, at least some governed structure in terms of the team, in terms of how we try to help each other, um, please join. All right. So current status, um, we were restructuring it over the last summit, which meant a lot of stuff got shifted. So if you're familiar with the MSCG, sorry for having to relook up your stuff differently, uh, but now it becomes easier. We have a lot of focus on the iOS security and reverse engineering. We actually uh, got a book and it got discovered. So I guess we should now promote it. Um, funny story about the book. Uh, it was only supposed to be there for uh, the sponsorship package. And then um, this guy found it on Hulu and he ordered it, tweeted about it, and we figured let's make sure it gets to a good level. So let's go use it. Uh, luckily, we also have just ebooks and just PDFs or you just go through GitHub book, etc. So what we're currently working on, um, so there have been various updates in iOS 12 and 13 and Android Pi and Q. Um, we have a few missing test cases in the reverse engineering area, uh, and we're um, working on automating the builds of the crack mees uh, and the playground to make it easier to make it compatible with newer versions of Android and iOS. If you're an iOS expert, or not even expert, but just a beginner level, or an Androidian who likes this stuff a lot, um, just join us, pick issues, work on them. Some of the people that have grown all the way to top contributor started as, I don't know anything, Android, um, Oh, this device is running Android. Okay. So even at that level, you can start contributing because it will end up with being a beautiful research class for you. Um, so I want a special thanks at the end because normally we toast over here, but then the wine would go die, would go dead. So let's go. Um, the leaders, contributors, co-authors, sponsors, and donators. We got quite a few donations, which we're going to use eventually to uh, pay technical editors, a lot of our users, and of course, the people that helped us out. Again, how you can contribute to the MSTG is stated over here. Just follow those guidelines, start picking stuff, and make it work. You can find it over here um, and do stuff with it. Um, we do have one final note, unfortunately. Um, ever since we got flagship, we got more attention from a commercial perspective, and we also got more opinionated um, uh, attention from people that wanted to be very clear on what they thought was right or wrong, given questions asked on Slack or Twitter by others. So please read the code of conduct before proceeding or just be nice. All right, thanks. Let's um, do some hacking, shall we? So um, questions so far? Yeah. Hey again. Um, yeah, just a question about uh, the integration of the SKF. You said there's like kind of discussion going on there. So what's what's the next step? What's the status? What's holding it back? Yeah, good question about the SKF. So um, the SKF has been evolving, of course, and so did the MASVS and the MSTG. So where they were evolving in terms of how to create cases and how to create content, we were evolving in the content itself. Um, we just said during the conference, sat down together to see for a path how this could be eased out. And we figured a solution that would make it easier for the SKF uh, to actually start adopting this. We're importing it easier and then have references to some parts of the MSCG. Um, so they don't have to copy paste everything, but it will be easier to have traffic to one to the other. Um, obviously that requires an internet connection at first, but we'll figure out something later for having stuff in databases. Uh, but we're actively working on it. 
um, and I think we'll get somewhere this year. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other? All right, so as I promised, this talk would actually be in the description about how to use this stuff, right? So let's let's dig in. So the easiest thing to start off with is network, because I think most of you will know some bits and pieces about how to do networking properly, how to secure that, etc. So if you look at the network communication requirements, this is the, the larger part of the list. Let's look at a few of them. So the hygiene requirements, the L1, L2s, um, basically means using TLS correctly, um, uh, make sure that the settings are aligned with best practices, make sure that you uh, verify a certificate properly and don't accept everything in the wild. For that, the MCG will then guide you to how to do that. So what does it mean to use TLS? Um, which settings should you use? And also refer to the RFCs for further explanation on what that means. Um, and of course, certificate validation. Um, it becomes more interesting when you're talking about pinning. So for instance, there's an L2 requirement where we say that you can uh, um, start to pin to a certificate or its public key. Um, and that's of course more interesting to start having a look at in terms of how we can then break that again, right? So who of you is not familiar with certificate pinning or public key pinning? I guess you're all familiar. So all of you will probably recognize what this is, right? The representation. All these fields together, what is it? Just shout it out. Sorry? Shout it out louder? No, I see, I hear some doubt. That's all right, that's all right. It's a certificate with its fields, gentlemen. Obviously, I can graph stupid stuff, but it don't work. Um, so given that little bit of a twitch that I just had with you guys, let's just still explain what happens, right? So when you create a connection, uh, with your backend and you're using TLS, what basically happens is that um, the client basically starts connecting the server, says, I want to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. Server says back, um, yeah, sure, you can talk with me. These are the type of protocols or ciphers that I support. These are the extensions I support. Go ahead. You as a client say, all right, well, I want to support these. Let's talk that. Then something is selected um, based on uh, the service configuration. Um, and then he sends back uh, uh, and the confirmation of what's going to be used and he's going to send his certificate or rather said the certificate belonging to the domain on where the uh, TLS terminating endpoint is basically running. That uh, certificate might also be augmented with a bunch of other certificates that basically show that the certificate is okay or not, uh, which end up is getting this sent. Um, and then, of course, the point pumps, that's where a lot of arguments has been in the past, is that certificate pinning has been implemented a lot in Stack Overflow, as in, look at all those beautiful bytes. Let's make sure all of them are the same. So then we talk about certificate pinning, which basically means at the moment your certificate has expired and you rotate it, all those bytes, at least these bytes will differ, so you can compare whatever you want to, doesn't work. So clever people said it just use the hash from that, the hash will, of course, differ the moment you have a new date, therefore breaks again, doesn't work. So you have the alternative public key pinning, where you basically pin to this little fellow. So the subject public key information, which basically has the algorithm identifier in the public key value, and sometimes you even just pin to the public key value itself. Um, little funny thing behind this, um, it's wonderful to have public key pinning or anything alike, but that does require that your organization is mature enough to protect the private key where the public key belongs to. Just saying. Um, so given that we implement that, how do we verify that? Um, so the MCG shows how you can implement that in various ways for Android and iOS because you have various methods to work with. Um, and even we do this on hybrids because we got this question so many times you figured, okay, okay, we just put it in and walk away. Fine. Um, but what about verifying it or bypassing it? So who of you bypassed and uh, uh, SSL pinning on mobile already? Okay, for those who raised their hands, about four. I'm sorry, it's gonna be incredibly boring the next 10 minutes. But um, for those who didn't, please pay attention. Um, there's a bunch of things you can do. So below, um, if you just wanna first check whether actually you got anything on in there. Below Android 7, just install your certificate CA on the device. On Android 7 and above, you have to actually rewrite the network certificate, uh, the network security configuration to accept the CA that you're adding, um, and then try to manage a middle application. Uh, similarly, in iOS, you install just the certificate, um, and then you try to manage a middle it. 
And then if the communicate, if you can't mend and middle it, you get a client side certification error or a, um, a client handshake, client side handshake field or client handshake field, you know, ah, at least something is happening over there that apparently seems like pinning. Um, so how do you want to bypass it then? So there's a bunch of ways to do this. And if we had all the time, uh, we could go through everything. So if you have time left, we can still do the demos of Android, but want to focus on iOS for now. So um, the first one is using SSL kill switch V2. Um, this is basically the most easy way because uh, that means you're going to do a jailbreak um, of the device. You install CDI, and with CDI, you're just going to install SSL kill uh, switch V2. The alternative is to do it with dynamic instrumentation on jailbroken or non-jailbroken devices, but we'll talk about that later. Um, Let's have a look at an application, for instance. So here we have an application, and here we have our beautiful burp suite running. And it's just um, a demo app. It's not a real Snapchat app, even though it might look like that. So we open it up. We enter our credentials. And it couldn't connect, because it's pinned. So we can't move forward. So in our settings, we have the SSL kill switch v2 standing by. We turn it on. And how you have to do this is all explained in MSG basically. And as you can see, um, even though the rest of the connection didn't work because that backend has been disabled, we did get the first handshake parts about the logging in and the credentials and stuff. That has been intercepted. So again, with SSL kill switch v2, sorry, that's a bit of a bug. So what happened basically? Um, what happens, SSL kill switch v2 uses the MS hook function from the mobile substrate, which is packaged within Cydia. And it starts patching certain operating system level methods. So on iOS 9, these methods are being patched, and on iOS 10 and 11, this one is patched. And the idea is basically when you do your NSL, when you do your uh, TLS handshake, you're using either um, NSL URL connection or something else. There's three different methods, I, I believe. Um, oh, sorry. And by having the method patched, even though these methods will give back error, failure, this is not okay, you basically patch the methods on an operating system level in such a way that they always say okay. So in that sense, there might have been an instruction to pin, and the pinning failed, or the validation of the certificate or the public key failed, but because we patched the methods, it will always say okay, so we can bypass them. Um, this is what you do on an operating system. The moment you enable this, SSL kill switch v2, you enable it for everything. So if you would use your own device for testing, be a bit careful, might help. Um, but what if you don't want a jailbreak? So jailbreaking requires maintenance. Who of you ever jailbroke a device? Whoever of you lost it accidentally due to an update? Because you're working on something, there's a pop-up, you thought you recognized the pop-up, you click OK, and then, ah, uh, OK, there we go. Um, it used to get harder to find a jailbreak. Thank Apple for iOS 12.4. It's a good thing, good thing. Because that makes it easier again, because although the rest of the free to talk will be about how important it is to have a non-jailbroken device to use it, uh, this version will allow you to do an easy job with that. Um, but the problem, of course, if you jailbreak and you have an app with jailbreak protection, then you also have to patch that for some reason, which is going to be harder because you've patched the operating system and not necessarily the app itself. So with Frida uh, and this wrapper around it objection, you can actually just start patching the runtime of the application itself. Let's have a look. So over here, we have a similar setup as we used to have last time. Now we're going to intercept stuff again. So we're using iOS deploy to deploy the application that's just been patched to uh, the device. Um, we skipped the patching process for sake of time. The always, unfortunately, one thing I have to note the moment you start doing this, the time we have to wait right now is not the demo effect. That's unfortunately natural. The latest gadgets with Frida have been quite faster, and there's newer versions of iOS Deploy that's more effective, but you end up with some waiting, basically, for, because of all the deployment stuff. So now we're you're running Objection, 
and we're running Objection Explorer, which basically means we're starting the interactive REPL. Um, and now we actually have a REPL inside the runtime of your app. Well, that's fun. Um, you can do a sorry, you can do a bunch of things with that. But more importantly, let's now just try to pitch the runtime. So Objection comes with a bunch of pre-packed Frida scripts, and one of them is just breaking the pin. So first, without you know patching it, let's just run it. So we get the notification, but no data. Going back, as you can see, there's auto complete. So that's really nice, actually. Now it's being patched. As you can see, a bunch of methods are being patched um, given the runtime. So now we run it again. We actually start other stuff getting poured in. And here it is, the data we've been waiting for. So that's actually quite easy to do. Uh, we're not creating those tools, but we do guide you basically on how to use them, which makes this all fairly easy. So what happened? Um, basically, underlying SSL stuff has been patched. So the runtime, uh, the method being used to call the system level runtime, system level methods, or the pre the package methods, have just been patched for this particular app with the Frida gadgets inside. That's a lot easier because now, all of a sudden, you can use your own device, relatively secure, as long as you don't use the, the app that you just tested with Frida to start doing normal stuff. Um, but you have a lot more freedom now. Obviously, you have something similar in Android, so you can use Objection with Frida in Android, and otherwise, if you have a rooted device, you can use Exposed for system-level patching. But we're going to skip that right now and for the sake of time. So let's take another one, authentication requirements. So that's a pretty long list, but one that's been um, around quite a few uh, a long time is biometric authentication, if any, is not event bound. Uh, using an API that simply returns true or false. Instead, it is based on unlocking the keychain or key store. Just to make sure, who of you went to AppSec Europe two years ago and what was at the don't touch me that way talk? Ah, that's good. Who of you ever bypassed um, uh, 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 biometric authentication till now? Ah, okay. Sorry, sir. But for the rest, I guess you all will have a nicer time. Um, so there's two ways to implement Touch ID. There's one where you basically say you're going to have a bunch of protection classes towards the keychain, which can only be unlocked via Touch ID or Face ID. So that means that you have to authenticate through biometrics to unlock the entry or actually unlock the key material that protects the entry in the keychain. That's very nice because that means that you have something to work with. The other way is using LA Context. The LA Context kind of works like this. So you implement a method that does the following. Local authentication context, evaluate the policy, make sure that you're a device or with the, the device owner with the uh, biometrics, give a localized reason. So this is where you put something in that's being there in the pop-up. And after that, you get a success or evaluate error, you get success, and then you call your success methods and you get a false or also failure. Wait, wait. Um, what's up with this? Um, what if we can call that directly? So, hmm, why bother with having, you know, any biometrics? Shall we try it? So there's a bunch of ways you can do that. You can either use Needle, which is another a mobile penetration testing suite, which you can use. The MCG will explain how that works. Or you can, again, use Objection. In both cases, what we're going to do is we're going to take that evaluate policy localize reason apply method and make sure that no matter when it's called, we'll always go into the success callback and just go for the success method. So for the sake of seeing something different, here's Needle. So when you start Needle, you have to do some pre-installation stuff, which we'll skip right now, but it's all applied later. So here you can see it's actually, uh, it's coming with a bunch of modules, and one of them is, for instance, the C-Encrypt Touch ID. And here you see the Neil the uh, client running or Neil server interface running. So now when we're trying to uh, log in, um, you have to put your Touch ID in, and uh, you just authenticate with Touch ID. There was no dialogue in there; it was just plain skipped because it wasn't there. Just to make sure, um, we also have a little video over here. What would normally happen if that wasn't the case? So here we have the same app, 
Sorry for going a bit up and down in there. So here you get the Touch ID pop-up, but with the other version, you don't. So in that sense, um, this makes it all fairly easy to break it. Um, luckily, we got more of these. So we got the uh, data storage and privacy requirements where we can do similar stuff with. Um, one that is particularly interesting, of course, is doing um, an IPC mechanism check with intents or with app extensions. But I figured it would be better if you test it yourself, because otherwise we might run out of time. Um, do you have any questions about what you just saw? in terms of Touch ID. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, sorry for the mic. So the Snapchat uh, sample app you showed, uh, was it written in uh, Objective-C or Swift? This was a demo app written yeah. in um, Objective-C, I believe. What yeah. You can do the same thing with a Swift app. OK. With Frida, you can replace implementation of either Objective-C or Swift. Yeah, that's the nice part. Right now, even though you have on a higher level, you use Swift, so then it's not doable to do uh, methods fizzling where uh, the thing it relies on. Um, but it's still using lower level APIs, which still use Objective-C. Yeah, okay. That, so so it's, it's really hard still to do swizzling or impossible in Swift, right? Yeah, that's not really doable. Thank you. Yeah. So the question is, do we have a good implementation of the proper one? Yeah. Let me, um, okay, we got a f we have examples in the MCG. If we have time left, please hold on to this question. I can show it um, and we can run through it. Um, so because it's, it's, it's good to show how not to do this. You just show us developers don't do it like this, but you also need to tell developers this is the right way of doing it and this is why. Yeah, so that's luckily in the MCG. Um, so we show how to do it in that sense. We show to which flags you should look for and where it's explained well enough to follow. Um, obviously, we just had to update it this week because we were behind one Swift version in terms of, so the whole flag naming got different. Um, but yeah, that's uh, we try to make sure that it's also clear what you have to do. And otherwise, we give enough hints for a developer so he knows what to look for when he looks for an example where we direct him to. Any other questions about what we just saw to now? All right, cool. So let's continue. So there's a lot more that we won't cover right now. We got reverse engineering in terms of uh, root and jailbreak detection, anti-debugging, anti-reverse engineering tools, uh, emulator detection, um, memory integra uh, integrity checks, device binding, obfuscation, even way more um, storage, cryptography, local authentication, network communication, platform interaction, code building, build settings, because there's a lot of freebies you get from the platform vendors to do stuff right. And with this, we believe you can make mobile security actually simple. It doesn't have to be hard as long as you uh, persist and read, basically. I know this is a lot to read through, and I don't think you should ever go through it just like that unless you really like it. Um, but going after the controls you think is valuable and reading up on those carefully can really help you to do stuff right. Luckily, there is a lot of parties that have gone through the MSTG and actually set up training programs. And if you want to just use those, we don't vet any of those programs. We don't look at them, um, but you can ask and check with the MSTG in your hand if it's done well, and at least you get then examples by a training, because we understand that going through all the material might be hard, and this might be an alternative. In the end, I still need you guys, all of you, to help us to the next level. At some point, just a week ago, we went, we had a total open issues of 105. <laughs> That's a lot, um, because we want to do this right, so we keep on evolving. Luckily, we're now somewhere around 90. Um, but there's still plenty of space to pick up. So if you're interested, come join us and uh, work with the stuff. Any other questions?
Okay, I believe we have some time left, right? Um, so if you want to, actually, no. We're we have about five minutes, yeah. About five minutes. Who wants to see some Android demos? Because I, yeah. All right, let me see. So remember we talked about the SSL pinning and we were, and we talked about the, um, uh, the uh, hacking playground. So this is an example of the hacking playground app where we implemented SSL pinning. So when you try to connect, basically we give the hint, you should see something over there. If you don't see something, something's awfully off. So there's nothing, right? So now we're using objection and given that it's a emulator, you have to basically uh, give the gadgets of the running app that's running. I hope you can see this. Otherwise you might have to do it live. So we're basically saying um, Android um, SSL pinning in it disable. So now it should be disabled. So if you click again, you get data. So most of the pinning strategies used in Android still use uh, known implement uh, known implementation methods um and those are easy to bypass or just patch which by the way is not a motivation for me to you guys to implement your own pinner that's not the idea of this because implementing your own pinner is can be hard and you can often make mistakes so it's easier to use a library which indeed can be bypassed but is having some because the moment you start implementing it yourself while well, the field is new to you it's easy to make mistakes in terms of what you should pin to how to do it etc so similarly we can do this if exposed so again the same device or uh, emulator so as you can see we don't see anything over there so nothing is happening so we switch to exposed and there there's a bunch of modules you can use in exposed the one that we've been using this time is oh it's a bit blurry sorry it's just trust me that's what we saw as a pretty reliable module that also works for okay HTTP 3 which is often used for handling HTTP connections yeah it's um, because we're using an emulator this is a big crash from time to time um, by the way, that's something you have to prepare for. If you do this stuff with an emulator, bring a big device to run it on um, and be prepared for crashes from time to time. But still for the ease of recording, that's what we did it. So now as you can see, because we enabled it, everything is being intercepted, but she's sent by the application operating system. So now if we... Uh, So now the request comes through, and this is the funny part. As you see, it took a while before the data popped in. When you use exposed on modern Android versions, you often get odd delays, which I can't totally explain because we didn't dive into it. So be a bit um, um, patient when you, when you use this. But as you can see in objection, it was a bit faster in that sense. So those are the demos for Android. Any other questions? Yes, sir, you're in the back. Oh, yeah, can I repeat the question as well? Oh. Is uh, pinning really widely used in the mobile world? Because in the browser world, Chrome deprecated it, Firefox and Opera still support it. Yeah, so it is widely used, but there's a difference in the pinning. Maybe we should go there once more, because the pinning you're referring to, actually there's, so the pinning you're referring to is HPKP, which stands for HTTP Public Key Pinning, which basically means sending a header with the thumb of the certificate saying, this is what thou shalt pin to. And people were easily able to break that and to flood the, the cache, etc. But here the pin is actually hard coded within the app. So we don't motivate, get all the pins uh, programmatically like HPKP, but you pre-program them basically. So the certificate or hopefully the public key is hard coded in the app. Yeah, but the reason why it was deprecated is because uh, web server maintainers uh, didn't manage to uh, uh, to deal with uh, the the keys properly. So a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot. 
So yeah. the reason could be the same in the mobile world. Yeah, we see the same thing going on, unfortunately. So there's a bunch of other requirements about having a proper update mechanism and a proper version whitelisting in your app so that you're sure that eventually you end up with the right public keys if you put it all together and the MCG guides you on doing so. Um, but in the end, that remains a hard job. So that's why it's an L2 requirement. So many apps that don't necessarily need to pin don't shouldn't pin because then you have the hard time of managing your certificates um, or actually the private keys that belong to them. Um, but if there's really risk involved, then this can really help. All right, so I just got the time up signal. Thank you very much for attending my talk.